ಅವರು ಒಂದೇನೆ ಯಾಕಂದ್ರೆ ಅವರು ನಮ್ ತಾಯಿನ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಲಿಸ್ಟ್ ಇದಾರ ಅಗ್ರಜರು ದಿಗ್ಗಜರು ಎಲ್ಲ ಇದಾರೆ I just told you because you had asked some people to join Allah, so I thought. <laughs> What I'm saying is like regularly, yeah, who value sharing birth or Allah, Allah, bandhi dharan ta noorta din nang bandh hai through gotak ta. You're talking on mute. Unmute. Akila ma'am, uh, we have uh, about sure. 42 people ma'am. I think... Uh, Ah, ma'am. Another two minutes. Four, five exactly will start. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Prasad sir is also here. Good to see him joining. Okay. Uh, yeah. They are ironic. <laughs> like Kavita ma'am is there. Uh, Rita ma'am is there. We are there. Um, I think people are yet to join. Those who come for the additional English violations, I'm just searching for them. It's meant more towards them, that's why. Should have called in Rashmi. Rashmi. Yes. Um... we'll start in another one minute i'll uh, start introducing ma'am so by then i think uh shruti ma'am are we good to go yes ma'am we can we can start ma'am we can start ma'am akila ma'am uh shruti uh, please send youtube link to usha ma'am or katyani ma'am so that uh, it can be posted in uh, okay, okay. Yes, uh, larger group Oh, to the SMS thing, is it? I mean, uh, WhatsApp, you mean? WhatsApp uh, uh, to the BC. No, really? huh, right. No, yeah. this is YouTube link. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, post both the uh, participant link. I think I have sent the participant link to BCU. Now, you say that we are uh, live on YouTube. Uh, kindly oh, yeah. join. Akilana, we can start. I've sent the link. Ah, sorry, ma'am. So we shall start. Ma'am, there are around 60 participants. I think we are good to go. Yes, can I have a bank loan account? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Am I audible? 
Yes, yes, you are. Good afternoon, everybody. I welcome you all to the day four of the FDP that has been organized by the Department of English in association with the IQAC of Jain College, Vasavi campus. Today on day four, we have reserved it to be the additional English Confluence 4 syllabus to be spoken about in detail. And we have with us two stalwarts to take care of the deliberations of today. The first speaker being, the first resource person being Professor Lena Karanth, uh, who has uh, post-graduated from Bangalore University uh, with the specialization of Commonwealth Literature and in phonetics. Uh, she has worked as a lecturer in uh, SSM RV JP Nagar soon after her post-graduation. And she is now working as the head of the Department of English in Bishop Cotton uh, Christian <clears throat> Women's College till date from 1995. She has been the member of Board of Examiners of BU for two years. She has been in the team of Board of Examiners of Maharani's Cluster University. She has worked for the Additional English Textbook uh, Committee for BU, that is Bangalore University. And now, right now, she has been uh, the chairperson for the Additional English Wing of Bangalore Central University, that is now Bangalore City University. And she is the chairperson. She also, uh, you know, uh, has worked as the external paper setter for various autonomous colleges. Uh, like NMKRV College, Maharani Lakshmi Amarni College, etc. I welcome you, ma'am, on behalf of the Jain College management and principal and staff. A very warm welcome to you. I request you to take over now, uh, and you have some 30 to 40 minutes uh, time, and kindly deliver your deliberations. Welcome you, ma'am. Thank you, Akila, for that uh, introduction. Well, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Jane College Vasavi Campus uh, Principal, Dr. Naveen Kumar, and the faculty members of the Department of English uh, for choosing me as a resource person for Confluence 4. And uh, today I'm here to deliver the presentation as to what went behind framing this textbook, not only Confluence 4, but from one to four. So four textbooks in the matter of two years for the fourth semester, we have uh, framed as a committee and uh, released it as a, in the form of a soft copy to the BCU teaching fraternity. Well, uh, before I proceed on the text as to what went to the text and the pieces, selections, et cetera, I'd like to start with the history associated in the formation of Additional English Textbook Committee. At this juncture, I would thank Dr. Chitra Panikar, Chairperson BCU, for choosing me as the Additional English Textbook Chairperson, with my consent, of course. In addition to this, my sincere gratitude to Professor Shiv Prasad for recommending my name to Dr. Chitra Panikar. Furthermore, he gave me the freedom to choose my team and did not interfere in my choice. Thus, a committee with six members and one BOS member at the helm of affairs was formed. I thank Dr. Macklin Moses, a BOS member, for having guided us throughout these two years. The name Confluence, the title for the textbook, was her idea. Thank you, ma'am, for saving the committee from debating, discussing the title. 
well, Dr. Chitra Panikar also insisted that there should be a representation in the committee from the autonomous college. Thus, Dr. Sushila was introduced by Dr. Macklin Moses. Thanking Dr. Macklin for giving us Dr. Sushila, who I would call a walking encyclopedia and the backbone of Confluence 1 to 4. She is, she is responsible for the blueprint of the four textbooks, the brain behind the selections of additional English. Thank you, ma'am, for all the support extended to us in these two years. Being in an autonomous college, it is a completely different environment in a, compared to we, uh, you know, the, the colleges working in the, for affiliated to the Bangalore University or the Central University, there is, uh, you know, always target to be achieved and workload is also too much. But still, you looked into our textbook requirements, answered our calls at any point of the day, time, and made us feel comfortable with your knowledge and having updated with the recent textbooks. Well, how can I forget my wonderful team that stood together in these two years, helping, supporting, contributing for the textbook especially through the pandemic, that is the last two books, Confluence 3 and 4. Thanking each and every one without which I could not have made this journey possible of coming at the end of the fourth textbook, Confluence 4. This journey to come up with a textbook is in a short span of time, especially the first textbook was really taxing. We had uh, not much time and uh, as BOS members and uh, the other authorities were behind us to get it as early as possible. The then uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Jaffet, and the Registrar, Professor Ramchandra Gowda, decided to come up with the new textbooks from BCU as we were an independent university. Henceforth, the committees were formed, the BOS was formed before that, and so we started working on the textbook. Let me tell you that our, uh, it was not enough that the committees were formed and the textbooks were ready. Here came the real challenge of releasing the text in the print form. We realized that we have to run kilometers of hurdle race to get it in the print format. By this time, we were being severely criticized by some eminent teaching fraternity members for the idea of a new textbook and also not releasing the new book on time because classes had already started and the circular on the website was issued about the new textbooks. Thus came the idea of releasing the soft copy on the BCU website. Quote, unquote, Professor Jaffet said, since we are the central or now it's the city university, the soft copy should work. Now it was the turn of Professor Shiv Prasad, BOS member, to run from pillar to post to accommodate the release of the soft copy. Single-handedly, Professor Shiv Prasad, as a BOS member, took up the Herculean task of monitoring the work of all the textbooks. Regular calls, regular updates, suggestions, inputs. So I don't know where to stop to tell how he led the battle against all odds in releasing even the soft copy. All put together, he saw to it that the text, of course not the print format, I repeat, it was a soft copy, was released on the BCU. Thank you, sir. And I take this opportunity to bring it to the notice of the, uh, you know, my teaching fraternity gathered today, the efforts put by Dr. Um, Professor Shiv Prasad in bringing out these four textbooks. And we still have the five, you know, two semesters to go, especially the communicative English and optional English textbooks. Two more semesters and still that is there. Or that is your responsibility, sir. So, I'm here to tell you that And then today, the soft copy has been a blessing in disguise to the teaching fraternity of BCU. Blessing because we don't have to go out and wait for either Subhash stores or um, Gangaram, Sapna to open 
and so together textbooks. Thus, technology has saved us. During this pandemic, and of course the lockdown, these factors are also responsible for the cough, you know, better usage of the soft copy. Sitting at home, helping our teaching fraternity on WhatsApp, email, we are passing across the textbooks within moments. So this is the journey or you call, what do you call as the history of these textbook committee, not only additional English, but all streams, optional English and communicative English. Well, coming to additional English in particular, I've been teaching additional English in the regular curriculum from past 20 plus years. I've understood that some colleges, that is the private colleges mainly, do include it in the regular teaching hours. And some colleges do not teach in the regular teaching hours, but offer a crash course at the end of the semester. I also heard that some students have to fend for themselves. So keeping this in mind, as a committee, we tried to be choosing simple selections where the students can comprehend and write it, answer it from their examination point of view, as well as relate it to the real life issues. So thus the committee came up with the theme-based selection. So here we go, first and second uh, semesters, we focused on translations. The third semester, we focused on Pan-Asian writers. The fourth, the present fourth semester conference four uh, deals with uh, focusing on post-colonial writers. Well, in the first and second conference uh, textbooks, we have made an attempt to bring the lesser known regional writers to the mainstream, attempting to give equal representation to all parts of India. Now, why translation? Why did we choose this or importance of it, relevance of it? This part of the talk will be taken up by Dr. Sushila in her uh, you know, session. The first post-colonial uh, writers, again, we have tried to represent all major colonies of the then British Empire, except India. So it's uh, namely Australia, New Zealand, Caribbean, Canada, Africa, and South America in the present uh, conference four. In the first and second, why translation? The committee did differ due to the poor quality of translation, but due to the able guidance of the Dr. Yogananda, our, who was our reviewer, we were able to choose good pieces of translation with standard English. I thank again Dr. Chitra Panika for having given us uh, Dr. Yogananda as our reviewer. And as a reviewer, I also thank him for his invaluable inputs, guidance, which made us choose selections which are repeated time and again in our textbooks, but still relevant. Quote, unquote, he said, pieces could be repeated as the students are new each year. Thank you, sir, for being with us and making this journey a smooth one. Well, uh, Dr. Naveen Kumar, the principal of Jain College, in his inaugural address pointed out that we, the textbook committee members, have given the roadmap to the teaching fraternity and following this roadmap, how to go about it is the talk today. And in our textbook, all the four, we have given the pre-reading sections, which has to help and will help the teachers and the students together to start the classes, chapters, selections with a discussion. So it need not be one way where the teacher asks questions and the students are there to answer. They can also come up with their own opinion about the given situation. And the pre-reading questions hints at the chapter. So they're ready to understand what is there ahead in the chapter. Well, uh, I'm going to talk about the grammar component next. Now, choosing grammar comp component for the additional English section was challenging because for additional English textbook, we have to be careful. As you all know, students from all streams, including optional English, 
form a part of additional English uh, category as it is introduced instead of the second language. A repetition of grammar topics definitely will not be received well by our students. Thus, we had to wait for all the other streams to choose their grammar and then zero down to do our selections. So in our uh, grammar sections, we have chosen those topics which are not included in the other stream. Moreover, our explanations are not in great detail. Our exercises are not in many num in, a, in great number because keeping in mind the online classes, keeping in mind the online material available in grammar, I think that our teaching friends can use a lot of exercises, examples from the internet. And so that's how it was framed. Well, we also took in Dr. Yoganandas um, idea where he says, grammar depends on how it is taught, so not on the number of examples or detailed explanations, which may or may not serve purpose. So I have uh, you know, the slide show there. So to start with the grammar components, Shruti ma'am. Visible? Is it visible? Yes, yes ma'am, it's visible. It's visible. Yeah. Now. Now, grammar components, now these uh, were the topics put in together in all the four textbooks. Now, why I have put it across like this and divided it into four is, now slogan, caption, leaflet writing, and advertisements are not included in one textbook. This is spread and divided in all the four. Now, why this comes under one uh, category is, when slogans, captions, leaflet, and advertisements are looked into uh, and has to be written, not only from examination point of view, but also it is relevant in today's uh, scenario. So slogan, caption, leaflet, and advertisement deals with lesser words, fewer words. You don't have to use complete sentences, error-free sentences, with an object, subject, verb, articles, proportions can be deleted. So this is something we would like to tell our students. So with lesser words, a powerful message can be passed across. So of course we need a proper foundation, grounding, grammar, all this. So if that is sound, these things can be looked into. Also the creativity of the student, the awareness of the students, the spontaneity, the presence of mind, all this should contribute in bringing out slogans, captions, and leaflet, of course, the advertisements. Now, the second category there, giving instructions, directions, generating interview questions, and conversation skills. This deals with the communicative skills. How do you communicate with the word? Now, we have giving instructions and directions are a part of our day-to-day -day lives. It could be at home, it could be to your friend, it could be to anybody on the road, strangers. Instructions and directions are given, for which we need a clarity. Okay, and this clarity-based English, where clear instructions are given without being amb ambiguous and vague, is one challenge. Then coming to generating interview questions. Now, come, given our designations, the student is supposed to answer, the teacher is supposed to question. So the questions are always asked by us, the teaching fraternity. So keeping this in mind, we thought let the students also ask questions. 
let them also raise questions without grammatical errors then came in generating interview questions and with conversation skills conversation between two or more people again connecting to the content connecting to the topic and also coming out with questions and answers was supposed to be looked into so this is exactly how you will be telling your students not only from examination point of view how will it help them in the uh, communicating with the outside world so giving instructions i think it's for five marks directions for five marks generating interview skills uh, questions five marks conversational skills five marks no it's not from examination point of view so please don't restrict them just to score five marks it is done given and you know formulated with the idea that we need to help our students in talking good english clear english and a simple english Uh, third category there paragraph writing information transfer picture composition and story writing this happen to be focusing on writing skills so writing is equally important not only from examination point of view even otherwise whatever uh, you know whichever job they are taking the written test they will have something to write from uh, you know based on their language skills writing especially now this close test again is based on grammar and comprehension comprehension passage was uh, you know really looked into from examination point of view mainly because this is one of the ways where the students can score marks because the passage is given the questions are there question answer there face to face so they could score some marks so put in together this grammar component all together is something that uh, we thought would uh, help our students and something which is not there in the other stream it could be commerce arts science and you know optional english or of course there is no grammar in optional english so that's where this grammar components were formed now i would like to shift from grammar components to the literary components now in the literary components as uh, the novel was supposed to be introduced and uh, decided at the bos uh, meeting that every uh, stream for the uh, additional english inclusive will come up with a novel because they had introduced a play in the third semester and the fourth semester will deal with a novel and again this novel had to be from the post colonial countries and so after many discussions we zeroed on onto this the rabbit proof fence by doris pilking garimara who is an australian aboriginal writer now before dealing with this uh, novel i want my teaching friends to introduce these concepts explain this the relevance of this yesterday today and tomorrow that is colonialism british colonization of australia now what is col british colonization of australia is the europeans had different challenges in different parts of the world when they went ahead with colonizations for their own reasons so british colonization of australia was something different and they had to mainly deal with the aborigines and uh, among the aborigines and many uh, you know Uh, names there prevalent there is this vatu and madu people and why i have picked up or the takamiti looked into this uh, madu madu people of australia was is molly that is the protagonist of the novel uh, happens to be from this community and the writer too belongs to the same community and the relationship between the white and the aborigines resulted in the half caste children and they are also known as the stolen generation now this i will not give any explanation for all these because we have given a clear explanation at the end of the text keeping in mind the needs of the students and the students who fend for themselves and of course our teaching fraternity so rabbit proof friends thus came into force uh, for as a novel for the first fourth uh, semester conference um, 
four. Now, now I have these images in front of me. Now, how do you approach the novel? Introduce Australia once upon a time. So this is the past of Australia. There is a traditional tribal dance there. And uh, to my left extreme, there is uh, the prisoners, the aboriginals being taken by the white people. And to my extreme um, right there up is the dwelling place of the uh, you know, aboriginals. And to both the other, that is the uh, picture one and picture four are the next stage where the original girls in one page, picture one happens to be there ready to go to a settlement chosen by the white man. And these are the original children for whom homes had to be searched for and there were advertisements. Now this is a modern day Australia. So this is the present Australia at its um, helm of office, you have the kangaroo there, the map, the present Australians, and these, you know, bridge. So this, you will have to tell your students that is a past and this is a present Australia, which is in existence. So they need to get an idea of all these um, features of Australia, the past and the present. Going to the next slide. As you can see, there is this uh, front page of the novel, Rabbit Proof Fence. You see the three girls there, and uh, they're the center or the main part of the plot. And there is a rabbit proof fence standing as a symbol. And the title says so. Now, what is it that is all about this? And there is this story is nothing but an epic journey made by three young girls, Molly, Daisy, and Gracie. So they set out on this epic journey of 1,600 kilometers, hope in their hearts and the faith to achieve what seemed to be unbelievable. This unbelievable was achieved as the children held on to hope and refused to lose their dreams to intimidation. The epic journey made by these three young girls in 1931 challenges us today to wonder what we could achieve if we dare to hold on to hope and faith to walk into the unknown. So this is something that uh, we thought would be uh, interesting for our students today as perseverance and walking that extra mile without shortcuts to achieve your goal is a key to success. And also what if there is no success? Failure also has to be tackled. Failure also has to be accepted. So these were the things that we discussed as to why we chose this uh, novel, Rabbit Proof Fence. So there are these three girls there um, walking. This is just an idea uh, to all of us saying that this is the girl, these are the girls, not that these are the exact girls, of course. The Australian terrain, the rabbit proof fence there. Okay. And on what terrain did they have to walk this thousand kilo, uh, 600 kilometers back home? Now, as you can see, there is this lorry load of rabbits. And uh, this is, of course, taken from a National Museum of Australia. Now, why rabbits are, were killed in such a great quantity? What did they do? What was the reason? So this also has to be looked into by the teaching uh, fraternity because a background for this has to be given. In the text, in the introduction, uh, we have mentioned as to why this particular uh, proof, uh, fa the fence came up. It so happened that with technology, there came various, uh, you know, with the various discoveries came the technology and there was this automobile industry and uh, the shipment came in progress, the technology improved. So with all this came the, uh, you know, Europeans traveled across the world and 
how could they miss Australia? So they landed in Australia too. And the result of the landing of this first fleet in Australia will have various reasons. Historically, there are many reasons as to why the uh, you know, colonization took place and why people came to Australia. One of them or one or two of them, I'm just uh, you know, mentioning here, I'm not going to in great detail with this, because the reasons, one of the reasons what I came across was uh, crowded prisons in Britain, the increased crime rates, and it this discovery of uh, you know Australian continent helped them bring uh, the convicts and fill the land there far away from their homeland. And uh, apart from uh, the historical reasons, the with the advent of the Englishman there came the rabbits along with him. Thus came the rabbits and became a pest which migrated across Australia. The numbers exploded and all efforts to control them yielded no results. There were many ways which you know, went in vain to control this huge explosion, population explosion of the uh, rabbits. They caused huge damage to crops and it was in millions. So they felt that with technology, isn't there a solution to this? And thus was the fence. It was decided in 1901, the Royal Commission addressed the issue and the idea of fence came into existence. And this fence happened to be uh, preventing the rabbits from getting into Western part of Australia to the, from the Eastern, sorry. So from the West to the Northern Australia, the fence was decided to be built for 1,600 kilometers. It is supposed to be the largest unbroken fence Though it was a crazy idea, according to you know the uh, white people themselves and the historians, to prevent the rabbits of all things entering the west part from the east, it is also there's also a mention saying that it is like the Great Wall of China, where you know it was done as a preventive measure to stop the rabbit from getting into from one part of the other. Now again, constructing this fence for 1,600 kilometers was not a joke. So the government heavily invested on this project. Around 300 to 400 people worked for the construction of the fence, facing all calamities of nature. Regular maintenance of this force, uh, sorry, fence was also done. Now, in order to maintain this force, the construction of the force, they were known as the boundary riders repair workers and all this were of were white people so the slide can you know tell you that these white people uh, were working and maintaining the fence so you can understand how much uh, you know damage that uh, the rabbit had caused to humanity in general well these white people who were working near the fence from relationship with the Aboriginal women, the children were known as the half-caste children. These half-caste children uh, became a burden to the government. They decided, the Australian government, the white government, decided to eradicate this uh, half-caste uh, you know, children for their own uh, good. So they thought that they were doing something good and uh, they were also telling that in the interests of the half caste children, they thought, you know, that uh, they would remove them from their Aboriginal families. So it is also said it was a very unwise decision to remove them from their Aboriginal families. So the main idea, the hidden agenda here was to remove them from their families, culture, and the plan was to send them to institutes to be raised and educated as Europeans. So they did not want another generation there, this mixed race, to cause an issue right in the years to come. So this forced, the removal, this forced, uh, you know, this forced removal caused great trauma to the Aboriginal families and children. The children were known as stolen generation. 
this is what the stolen generation is you know the picture there that i have given you you can also notice there is uh, that white man at the helm of affairs who would have been in charge of these particular uh, places at uh, all particular uh, you know junctures there at given point of time and they were trained in you know in order to become maids or could be in in the field of education maybe as missionaries so with the vested interest the australian government looked into this half caste children so that they could become better individuals and be trained and uh, develop a sort of a lifestyle like the europeans now i have chosen this jigalong shop there has there are many stations which were uh, in progress during this uh, period of the maintenance of the fence the construction of the fence but i have chosen jigalong because molly the protagonist of this novel was from jigalong and there was this was a station for the rapid fence workers too of course the store also distributed the sugar tobacco flour and other necessities to the martu or the mardu people to which molly belonged to and this was the last indigenous generation who came into contact with the europeans Molly was born in 1917 she is a protagonist of the novel as uh, you have seen in the initial uh, slides where there is just a tallest girl there in the picture the father was the inspector of rabbit proof fence daisy the youngest was her half sister and they had the grazy the in between who was 11 years old in course of time as was the norms these three girls were removed from their family forcibly in 1931 and taken to the moor river settlement so what you see there uh, you know is the moor river settlement of course to you and me it appears to be a very cozy uh, living place dwelling place for these half castes who are living in the forest in the desert and under the mercy of nature um but what is what exactly was happening in the moor river settlement was something very different so there were no decent services offered which it claimed to be there were cramped quarters hygiene was not looked into and the children were brutally treated of course they might have been given meals but they were also educated right to you know them that attempt what may was made to educate them in various categories well there was this uh, character by name uh, mr neville in the novel who was supposed to be the protector of the aborigines and had also the power to remove the half caste from anyone to anywhere so he was given the authority to deal with these half caste children to remove them forcibly if required from their original families that is the aboriginals and bring them here to the moor river settlement and here arrive morley molly daisy and uh, gracie after 100 1600 kilometers of journey here the girls were forced to sleep indoors and had to follow a strict daily schedule well uh, in order to reach here it was a, they took a weeks time they had to travel via, via car uh, train and ship in order to reach the settlement of theirs and following a strict daily schedule sleeping indoors was a foreign concept to the girls who were used to freedom in the great spaces of their backyard thus they were restless they longed for the red sand of the desert the starry sky of the night and the warmth of the campfire and above all the security of the family they longed for home they only stayed for two nights in the scrum quarters and molly decided to leave so it was her decision that they were not going to stay here they will not be putting up with all this Uh, you know ill treatment meted out to them by the white authorities thus hope in the hearts and a deep longing for their family and land the girls set out on an epic journey 
of 1,600 kilometers long and definitely following the rabbit proof fence. They were going home. So this was very clear with them. Well, I think we can gauge that given the situation that they were in and the terrain that they were going to walk. The journey was tough. They were exposed to cold and hunger, heat. They were exhausted. But also they were, uh, you know, shown kindness by the strangers whosoever met them. They were given you know, supplies of food. At one point of time, there were these Mardo people themselves gave a matchbox. I think you can, you know, it will be there in the novel. I have not dealt so detailed with the novel and the chapter wise summary so that you can do it in your classroom activities. So with food and clothing and also the directions were given to them to reach to the northern part that is Jigalong. The girls had too many tasks apart from the weather conditions, the hunger, the heat and everything. They, are, they also had to be uh, safeguarding themselves from Mr. Nevely's policemen, tracers. It was a big news in the Australian, uh, at the Australian government level, official level, that these tracers were not able to trace these two, three girls, and a lot of expenditure was also involved in this. So money was being spent with no results. It did. The girls survived due to the bushcraft skills. So as Aborigines, they also knew how to eat the roots, uh, kill those lizards and the worms. And how to be, you know, how to, the method of making it delicious to their meals. So that's they survived. And uh, these skills were definitely taught to them by their mothers, uncles, and aunts. So at one point of time, it so happens that some uh, stalkers happen to meet them. And they tell that uh, Grace's mother has shifted to some other station and she is not in Jigalong. So there you see Gracie taking a different route where she thinks she can catch a train and go and stay with her mother. So there they depart, whereas uh, Molly and Daisy, they continue the journey, whereas Gracie is uh, you know, going in search of mother. But I think as I expected, and uh, as we all know, she was uh, caught by the authorities and was back at the Moor River settlement. Thus, the journey continues, longing for home and hope in their heart, which drove them home. You can see that they were united with their families after nine weeks of walking. Now, this is what I have tried to make a very simple presentation just to give my preaching fraternity an idea as to how to approach the novel. I have made it a point not to summarize the novel in detail, not to give you chapter by summaries, no characterizations done, character analysis, critical analysis, that is all your classroom activities. Now, these are the themes that could be taken from uh, you know, these three young girls and the purpose of the author and what is it that uh, is relevant today. I think everything should be the lessons from the natural world, Aboriginal spirituality, how do you, you know, deal with the land, relationships with the land, family bonding and perseverance, courage, determination, faith, this is, which is the need of the art, not only for us, even for the students. In spite of all this, I think in the colonial world, uh, colonized colonies, injustice still persists. And in the book, the author moves back and forth in time, leaving the reader to piece together the chronology. So what I would suggest is, um, it's, uh, these are the resources from where I have recently drawn for my uh, talk today. And uh, the YouTube video and the movie can be shared first with the students. Now, I think some of them uh, tell me that how is that they may start writing about the movie, comparing it. Okay, fine, no issues. The Incredible Journey and the movie by Philip Noyce will give them a clear idea about the 
turmoil trauma and the injustice meted out to them by the white people so given this in the background you can start reading the novel you can make them read novel you can discuss it so in, instead of making it one way always make it a discussion interesting and see if you can quote relevant example from our real life situations where a student may come up with it so with the online classes in progress for the semester also looks like we are you know we have to be equipped with a better um, strategy to do to deal with this lengthy text we have taken care but uh, compared to the other lessons maybe this is a bit lengthy so here i finish my talk and i only dealt with the approaches that could be used for this uh, novel and just giving you a very slight sketchy summary of the novel in short so thank you um all uh, i think it's uh, dr sushila's turn to go ahead with the uh, talk and uh, any questions we will take it at the end that is after dr sushila's talk thank you thank you Thank you, uh, Lina, ma'am, for that uh, exhaustive, comprehensive overview of uh, Confluence, um, all four semesters' textbooks, and uh, the journey that you took us through the rabbit-proof friend fence. Uh, I'm sure uh, the students also will be interested more uh, in knowing uh, how you know the girls could achieve their. you know home uh, as the achievement so thank you uh, lina ma'am for that and um, now uh, i'll i'd like to introduce another spoke, uh, resource person dr sushila b uh, who currently teaches as the associate professor uh, teaches to the ug and pg level um, in <clears throat> jyotinivas autonomous college uh she has in her 24 years of teaching experience a wide range from being a school teacher she is like you know like a uh, step by step and now she teaches the um pg students so she has a very thorough knowledge of how uh, english language uh, uh, is been taught from the elementary level to the higher levels um she has been the teacher and high school teacher and the principal of shri orbindo school jss public school um and sidganga public school and also uh, you know uh, being the now uh, currently working at jyotinivas college as a as an associate professor uh, her area of teaching include commonwealth literature indian writing in english american literature and Uh, she uh, having a phd um, her additional qualifications are she has um, diploma in french and currently pursuing and uh, she has undertaken the training in intel innovation in education participated in international academy for creating te creative teaching uh, she has participated in comprehension and vocabulary building i act she has also participated in the sahodaya uh, schools and her certificates and awards she has some 10 to 15 paper publications in the um, recognized journals and she has been the member of world wildlife fund for nature so her you know experiences as you know her experience and her interests are as diverse as it can be for a human being and she is a wonderful human being thank you sushila ma'am for being associated with us uh, as a part of the textbook committee uh, for additional english bangalore city university um now i welcome you to deliver your talk on confluence thank you akila over to you uh, 
Ma'am, can yeah. I share your the share? The yes, slide? yes. Please share the first slide. Thank you, Lena, ma'am, for taking us through the journey of textbook making, giving importance to grammar and the uh, wonderful uh, uh, the backdrop to Australia, uh, the Aboriginal life and all that. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be a part of this deliberation faculty development program on effective curriculum. My profound thanks to the principal, Dr. Naveen Kumar, who has... Um, who was behind this ingenious idea of planning the FTB program. I thank the IQSC in association with the Department of English in organizing a five-day FTB program. It gives me an immense pleasure to share the platform with Professor Lena Karan, chairperson of the textbook committee, HOD, Department of English, Bishop Gordon's Women's College, and Akila, who is a colleague of mine, where we share a lot of uh, uh, moments in our textbook making with, uh, to share a few thoughts and ideas. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this deliberation. Can we go to the next slide? Yes. Uh, as ma'am has already given uh, uh, the, the, the name of the text, Confluence for additional English textbook for BA, BCom, BBA, BSc, and BCA. I'll just go briefly through the objectives and the making of the textbook, which has already been done. So for the textbook confluence board, we travel beyond national boundaries and develop a textual roadmap for certain key cultural milestones from the Asian continent to other countries. The topics were carefully chosen to create the growing interest in the academic circles. Uh, specialize in the area of their choice and further enhance in their academic growth. The students get exposed to varied literatures of post-colonial countries and understand the diverse cultures, religion, histories of various colonized countries in their pre-colonization and post-colonization sensitivity to ecology and environment. Here we can see the pictures of the countries where we are going to take you through the journey of uh, Amazon, uh, the Caribbean literature, then West African literature, Nigeria, Canadian literature, and Oceanic literature, New Zealand, and of course, Australia. Slide, please. Now, what is post colonial? What is the term post colonial? If it uh, uh, why is it important for the students to study? What does the post-colonialism mean? And uh, what, how, how are we going to discuss uh, all this in this particular textbook? So post-colonial studies offers students the opportunity to study the history and legacy of uh, colonialism and how colonial relationship continue to influence the post-colonial uh, present and how, moder how modernity and colonialism displaced, colonized societies, knowledge and experience and restored the multiplicity of life. The term post-colonial designates English language literatures from Asia, Africa, Americas, the Oceania, as well as the literatures of the diasporic communities who have moved from these, those regions to the global north. This textbook conference four introduces central themes of post-colonial literary studies and delineates how the themes are reflected and elaborated with the exemplary literary works by post-colonial authors from, from around the world. Based on the reading on the textual analysis, a few literary works from Africa, Caribbean, Canada, New Zealand, Nigeria, and the text revisits the literary canon through the lens of the power relationship between individuals, language, and literature. One gets to know the cultural dominance, racism, quest for identity, inequality um, by going through these pieces. The post-colonial writers reflected and demonstrated many thematic concepts, which are quite uh, connected with both the colonizer and the colonized. So the textbook Confluence 4 introduces the central themes, as I have mentioned, 
And uh, next slide, please. Yes. Yes. What does post-colonial studies include? What kind of literature are they exposed to? Uh, what uh, students uh, should uh, learn from this post-colonial literature? This is very important. Literature that includes the study of the theory and literature as it relates to the colonizer and colonized experience on cultures and society. It represents the first world countries, Europeans ruled and controlled the third world cultures and how these groups have since responded to and resisted those encroachments. Post-colonial literature exposes the racist imperial thoughts, deconstructs them, it creates a room for the subaltern to speak. As a literary theory, it deals with literature produced in countries that were once colonized and demonstrated heterogeneity of the colonized people. Next slide, please. The interesting fact is about the piece, The Lost Tribes of Amazon, which takes us to the beautiful rainforest bursting with life, which is a home to millions of species, plants, and tribals who dwell there. It is also a home to more than 10% of the plants and animal species, making the Amazon the most biodiverse landscape on earth. It's the home for more than 480 species of different tribes and indigenous group having their own language and literature and territory. Their early account is very important as they were explored by Europeans 500 years ago. So they are left a few in number today and have been scattered. It is important to know that their culture, food, medicine, religion, their sustainability existence and their worship to mother nature where they are living close to it. The migration or rather um, extension of the tribes of Amazon dwelling in the rainforest have now become a thing in the past. The rainforests of Amazon are bursting with life and uh, almost uh, most of the tribals today uh, they are facing extinction, and we are going to uh, study more about it uh, in the next slide, please. Uh, yes. Now, uh, I just put this slide because to show that Amazon rainforest animals, the rainforest, as I mentioned, houses distinct and varied species, varieties of animals, and some of them are uh, rare species and face extinction due to extensive uh, uh, poaching. So you can see the different kinds of species uh, in this slide and the, the rich biodiversity in the Amazon. Next slide, please. And uh, the rainforest region is a, a home of several fascinating bird species, which includes different kinds of parrots, hornbill, tokens, raptors like eagles, hawks, and Vulture. These birds are found exclusively in the Amazon rainforest and they live in the dense undercover of the forest looking for insects. Some of the birds have become extinct, extinct due to the over poaching uh, by the poachers. Next slide, please. The rainforests are the home of several indigenous tribes, like mentioned in the text, the Yukana tribe, the Yuri, Jukana, Pase, Nukak. Unfortunately, these tribals are hunted and uh, hunted down, massacred, chased, shot at. And today, only a few of them remain in number. So the lost tribes of Amazon, next slide, please. We can see the different tribes because, yes, the lost tribes of Amazon, consists of the oral and written literature of Latin America <clears throat> and rose globally in the second half of the 20th century. The last tribes of Amazon is a part of, um, a very important part of post-colonial literature. 
and very rich in oral culture. It gives accounts of mythological and religious belief during and after the colonial period. The church played a very important role in bringing out the written texts, memorable poetry and philosophical sayings and rose largely due to the success on the style of a very important theme called the magic realism. The richness in Latin American culture owing to the colonization, settlements of indigenous communities such as Aquisha, Maya, Ajmara, Yukana, Yuri, Chikuna, Pase, and Nukak, etc. So studying of their history of the indigenous group are important and safeguarding their ecology and environment and is vital. Safeguarding the rich biodiversity is impeccable. So you can see some of the pictures. We can see the picture of Amazon. And uh, uh, the next slide, please. The How uh, in, the Europeans invaded the rainforest, which has caused a lot of damage, damage to the forest as well as the tribals who live there. The lives of these tribals were threatened with the invasion of uh, the Europeans who were actually the gold diggers, loggers, settlers, narcotics and trafficking. The tribals were exploited, they were flogged, they were tortured, they were starved, they were murdered, uh, who resisted them. Today, unfortunately, the remaining of the tribes live in poverty alcoholism, unemployment, and utter dependence on tourism. Next slide, please. Latin American literature was brought to the mainstream where, uh, with the contribution of rich literature, fiction, poem, novels, and essays. Can I see the next slide, please? The renowned Latin American writers who enriched the languages and brought it to the main stream um, are Gabriel Mistral. They're all the Nobel Prize winners. Gabriel Mistral, 1945, she won the gold prize, gold Nobel Prize. Uh, can I see the next slide, please? You can see how the people of, yes. Uh, Miguel Angel, you can see the, uh, the chronological order I have put. And um, see, these writers are the Nobel Prize winners and have contributed a lot to the Latin American literature and brought it to the mainstream. Their writings were rich in oral accounts, the magical realism, religious beliefs. Hence, it is imperative to learn the history of tribals dwelling in the rainforest. Here, I have put the pictures of the Nobel Prize winners in different years. And, uh, the author who has written The Lost Tribes of the Amazon, you can see him here with the uh, tribal people here. Uh, this is a picture of Gabriela Mistral, who has won the Nobel Prize in 1945. Then Miguel Angel Astruas, 1967. Pablo Neruda, who won the Nobel Prize in 1971. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, one of the renowned uh, writers of Latin America, won the Nobel Prize in 1982 and Octavia Press won the Nobel Prize in 1990. All these people are the instrumental in bringing the Latin American literature to the mainstream and enriching it with their powerful themes. Can I have the next slide, please? Latin American, I'm sorry, um, yes. Next, we go to the Caribbean literature. The Earth is Our Friend, one of the beautiful poems by, written by Yusuf Afari, a Jamaican writer. And uh, uh, it is very important to know, the students should know about how these are all the colonized countries and how, how they were colonized, who are the people who have come, uh, called the Great Exploration uh, in 1498, to the Europeans to the different parts of the world. So in... Uh, mm, uh, the uh, you can see the picture of Christopher Columbus and the West Indies. The West Indies is a beautiful place, a group of islands. It's a crescent-shaped islands in the North Atlantic Ocean. It is discovered by Christopher Columbus and later on uh, invaded by the British and British dominated uh, the islands. And 
Today, the descendants of the West Indies are from Africa, who were brought to these islands to work in their plantations. Though it became uh, independent in the year 1962, it continued to be a part of the Commonwealth. And uh, this area provides an important platform for post-colonial studies. One can enjoy the diverse cultural reading while going through the piece. Next slide, please. The earth is our friend or children of the earth, as it is called. You can see Yusuf Afari here. Arabian literature is also known as the black uh, literature. Uh, Yusuf Afari, a Jamaican poet, uh, takes us through the journey of a tropical marine mountains, terrain and beautiful land and sea, tropical breeze plateaus, giving a rich picture of the environment. You can see the slides which I have put there environment and ecology and how important it is to protect nature and when nature is giving us in bounty. Jamaica is a Caribbean island nation and it has a rich topography of mountains, rainforests, reef lined beaches. It has the largest number of English speaking, um, English speaking. Though it was colonized by the Dutch and French and the British who came later on, they, uh, it remained as a part of British domain till 1960 and continued to be under the colonial uh, rule uh, and continued its colonial ties with UK even till today. So their literature, Caribbean literature is exceptional in both language and subject with very powerful themes like innocence, exile and return to the motherland, resistance and endurance, engagement and alienation and self-determination. Uh, these are all also can be seen just now where Lena Mam has given a wonderful presentation about the novel. This also is similar to the kind of themes like, as I uh, mentioned, the exile, the uh, longing uh, to go back to the motherland, the endurance, the resistance, these are all very important. It provides a platform for, to post-colonial studies and to Caribbean literature, which has a distinctive history, like the experience of the colonialism, slavery, and intended servitude, the multiplicity of races, culture, and language, and insular and maritime condition. Next slide, please. Caribbean islands, environmental problems, and colonial experiences. As we can see, the poet draws our attention to the environmental problems, like the land erosion. In the first slide, you can see the first picture in the slide, the deforestation, decreasing of the forest, and damage done to the coral reefs. You can see this picture here. Increased insect outbursts, declining water supply, reduction of agricultural yield, flooding and erosion of the coastal areas. These are some of the uh, 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 environmental problems which have been vexing them. And also, if you look at the island West Indies, it is also a land of rich natural resources like limestone, metamorphic rocks, igneous rocks, rich and diverse ecosystem. System. One, one minute, please go back to the next slide. Yeah. Yes, millions of Africans, Indians, Asians were brought to the Caribbean islands between 15th to 19th centuries. Today, Caribbean literature is written by their descendants who are active in literature and arts and music. Caribbean music is very famous. The jazz the, comes from there. The jazz music comes from there. West Indies as a group of islands, are very important part of post-colonial literature. And it is very important to know uh, about the environmental problems the land is facing. And uh, the poet Yusuf Arafi particularly talks about uh, these vexing issues in his poem. The next slide, please. Now, African literature, the first generation writers who laid the foundation for the post-colonial African literature. Here I have put the pictures of uh, Chinna Achube, who uh, the African 
uh, people belong to different tribes. So Igbo tribe is very famous and his book called Things Fall Apart, I think it is a masterpiece. Amos Totula belongs to the Adgami tribe, is a West African writer. He was the first African to make an attempt to write in English. Then Mule Soinka belongs to the Yoruba tribe. The Interpreters is, a one, is the only novel he has written. And uh, he has written a number of plays. He's also a, a playwright. And the one can, uh, I think, uh, uh, must have heard about his famous poem called The Telephone Conversation, which talks about racism here. And uh, Yogi Wang Tiango uh, belongs to the Kikuyu group and his uh, novel, A Grain of Wheat. These are all the early African writers who vehemently wrote to correct the distort notion of Africa held by Europeans. So despite the robust uh, hope and idealism echoed in negritude literature about Africa, the reality in post-negritude points, a dismal picture of despair and dissolution and uh, corruption, brutality, conflicts, uh, these are some of the themes and uh, which were uh, facing um, the African writers. And they were all quite contrary to the idyllic picture of the founding fathers of negritude. Next slide, please. As I have mentioned that uh, uh, the African writers during the dying days of colonialism, Africa experienced a, uh, a tidal a wave of nationalistic fervor in her struggle to overthrow the yoke of colonial contraption. Now, this is Amo, uh, Amos Totula, uh, uh, who has uh, uh, made the first attempt to write in English, the palm white uh, drinker, it is called. And it is not unusual that negritude was characterized by glowing depiction of Africa and the celebration of African colonialism. So uh, once upon a time, the poem by Gabriel Okara is uh, uh, about uh, certain issues faced by the uh, African people. Rulers have changed, but the rule remained the same. The first and the second generation writers wrote a pre-colonial and colonial Africa. Nations struggle for independence, the cultural route, for example, the black man and the white man. Then uh, why did the first generation uh, uh, writers write? To re what did they write in, uh, to the audience? What, did, what powerful themes did they write in their books? So to reveal the truth, exploration of the post-independence, the disillusionment which followed after the post-colonialism is something which we can see in their works. The second generation writers dealt with post-independent situations, neo-colonialism, colonial hangover, then reformulation of old justice, corrupt society, corrupt leaders, and civil wars. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? I particularly brought this slide because uh, the huge continent, Africa, has been exploited for its rich mineral resources, oil, cotton, mercilessly killing of animals, you can see there, birds, animals and birds, then deforestation, extensive uh, uh, chopping of trees, then slaves that were transported to various destinations by the Europeans, and how uh, uh, it, uh, the place was exploited. And these are the vexing issues. You can see this uh, um, this, the, how the slaves have been tortured and how they have been chained. And this Africa is rich in natural resources. You can see how are the animals have extensively uh, uh, poached and uh, this is extensive damage done to the environment. So Okara, next slide please. Once upon a time, uh, written by Gabriel Okara, a Nigerian poet, playwright, and novelist, uh, is uh, a Nigerian uh, writer who belongs to the Jar tribe. His writings were very popular and were translated into several languages. And he was the first Nigerian to write uh, and publish in the literary journal called The Black Office, which I have put here. 
In 1953, he won the best award for literature in Nigerian Festival of Arts. The first modernist poet of Africa, his poems showed great sensitivity, perceptive judgment, and a tremendous journey. He showed concerns regarding what happened when the ancient culture of Africa faced with modern Western culture. Once Upon a Time is one such poem which shows uh, the anxiousness and the concern. A brilliant poem where the father teaches the son and it illustrates the relationship between the West and Nigeria. He starts the poem like a fairy tale, Once Upon a Time, where it also draws an analogy that uh, uh, oral tradition was very popular among uh, the writers. His wonderful message to the loss of youth, youthful idealism, corruption, influence of age and money, a poem which is subscribed in the syllabus. So students, can understand the various themes like the parent-child relationship, the clash of culture and violence, nostalgia, regret and hope, truth and honesty, and dependability. Next slide, please. Another important post-colonial aspect is a, a poem by a Canadian uh, author, Lucy Maud Montgomery, uh, with a Canadian author best known for a series of novels beginning in 1908 with Annie of Green Gables, a very uh, enjoyable novels. She is also a short story writer and wrote about 530 short stories and 30 essays. Her works offer fresh, timely approach to the issues of culture, identity, health, and globalization. She found uh, companionship in her imagination, nature books, and writings. Her works will help us to understand the experiences of social cultural artifacts, constructs the ways of interpreting and responding uh, to these experiences. The poem, The Day Of, exposes the role of nature in our lives and where nature plays and brings relief from our st stressful life. It is the duty of mankind to protect nature uh, being in a cold country uh, it is. Um, it has an astonished uh, backdrop of nature. It's important to know about Canada as it is the home of 30,000 indigenous people, colonized country under the British domain. Uh, please, uh, the next slide, please. You can see uh, the map of uh, Canada under the British colonies are set up there. You can see in this map, the red color area where the British colonies have been set up in the world. And you can see the Canada, the entire thing is a red color. You can see the domination of the British colonies. Even till today, Canada is still under the British crown and Queen Elizabeth is the head of the state. We have put a picture of her. Canada is one of the most beautiful places in the world with, and uh, it consists of indigenous tribes. Next slide, please. Yes. The next important uh, piece is uh, The Garden Party by Catherine Mansfield, a new piece from New Zealand. New Zealand is a beautiful place, an isolated island traditionally grouped under the um, Oceania. It is a mysteriously fascinating country with extremely picturesque landscape, mountains, lakes, and unique biodiversity. The fertile land with bending climate, free of starvation, class of war, teeming cities, the land of indigenous Mauro culture. Owing to the remoteness, it was the last large habitable land settled by humans. It was invaded by the Dutch following by the British, became a part of the British Empire and created a colony. The Garden Party, a beautiful piece by Catherine Mansfield, a modernist short fiction writer, with the reading of this piece, prose is important as present generation should know about the past and how useful it is for the students to know more about the class distinction, the society, than the symbols of social status, the growth and maturity of idealistic character, then upper classes versus the lower class. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, next. Um, uh, just a small brief uh, throwback to the confluence tool translation by translation plays a very important role. I just uh, took about two examples here and how it is introduced to students coming from various corners of 
the country from abroad, then keeping okay. in mind the ethnic and linguistic pluralities of the students who study additional English paper, and it is designed to capture multiple sensibilities from the multiple cultures uh, uh, through texts in translation. So literature in a translation form an extreme salient aspect of the study of various, various re regional ethos, India being a heterogeneous country. This text examines the study of various threads of traditions binding the various cultures of the society. We can see this, uh, the varied cultures of the society here. This is an attempt to bring forth the texts of different regions of the country, which illustrates this matter. The idea of bringing out translation is to develop a greater holistic perspective of cultures growing out of one's own. The next slide, please. East and the Northeast is a very important uh, uh, part of our country. The main thrust of translation is useful in representation of the literatures and cultures of the East and the Northeast, bringing them to the mainstream about their cultures and sensibilities. We can see the Northeast, the map of Northeast and the different kinds of tribals here. The Northeast has been a fringe of mainstream literary conscious, etched out by the complex and socio-political problems, crisis of identity crisis and prolonged use of guns. The, their literature draws narrative folklore, songs and social rights, ethnic and uh, religions, individual memories, suffering, violated policies, terror and loneliness. Two beautiful poems which reflect on the Northeast were the, the Spear, which is an identity of the people of Nagaland and Manipur. Why should I love these hills? Reflect on the identity crisis, social, political problems, ethnic problems, the rich cultural divergence, etc. It is very important for the students to bring out the Northeast literature into the mainstream and understand their vexing problems. Powerful writers like Temsula Ao, uh, uh, who has uh, uh, written, there are uh, today, uh, there are a lot of uh, Northeast writers who have, uh, they are called as the first generation writers who have brought the Northeast um, literature into the mainstream. Uh, next slide, please. I've come to the end of my presentation and uh, I would like to thank uh, the principal, Dr. Naveen Kumar. It is an honor to be a part of this deliberation. I wish to acknowledge with deep sense of gratitude and thanks to the principal, Jane College Vipram, for conducting a meaningful five-day FTP program on the platform to exchange our views and thoughts. Professor Akila, a profound thanks to you. A dear colleague, a friend, and member of the textbook committee for giving you an opportunity to express a few thoughts among the August gathering today. Her immense contribution, valuable suggestions, inputs were extremely relevant. A big thank you to you, dear Akila. Dr. McQuillan, I'm indeed uh, blessed to have a wonderful colleague with whom I share beautiful memories in our, when she used to work in our department. And a profound thanks to you for giving me an opportunity to be part of the additional English textbook, which was a marvelous experience and a memorable journey for me. A sincere thanks to you, dear Mac, and Professor Lena Karan, the chairperson for the additional English textbook committee, the Chori Department of English, which is in Women's College. I'm deeply indebted and grateful to you, ma'am, for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this wonderful journey and making the additional English textbook uh, a memorable one, your motivation, guidance, enthusiasm. Through, throughout my endeavor is acknowledgeable. Your patience, meticulousness, critical insights, and your constant support has brought a sense of direction and a concrete shape to the textbook. Thank you, dear ma'am, uh, for all your support and encouragement. And the textbook committees, I would like to put a quote here, teamwork, uh, divides the task and multiplies the success. The success is owing to the wonderful team we have. It is with great sense of 
pride and pleasure that I would like to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to all my dear colleagues, the committee members of uh, Additional English Textbook. It was a memorable journey. I'm deeply indebted to you, all the colleagues and cherished every moment uh, with all your affection, cooperation, and the help rendered a profound thanks. I thank the audience and the students and the participants today who play a very integral part um, of uh, today's uh, web, uh, FTP program. Thank you for your August presence and adding, which I, uh, I'm sorry, presence and adding more value to this beautiful program. Uh, in the end, I thank each and everyone. Thank you, Usha Ma'am and Kathyani and, uh, and the others who, uh, for the uh, PPT where I'm technically challenged, thanks to the pandemic where I have learned little bit of how to make a PPT. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sushila, ma'am. Uh, it was indeed a very uh, great pleasure to listen to your uh, knowledgeable and insightful talk. Uh, I, I really mean uh, it was very useful for us to you know, take the pieces through uh, to our students uh, in a better manner. And um, uh, we could Thanks. see the effort which, uh, you know, uh, ha would have been, you know, like gone uh, to make those PPTs. Uh, it, it was very, you know, colorful and actually it, it took all our attention as in it captured all our attention throughout your talk. Thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, I'm also happy um, uh, to have been uh, a part of this textbook committee where I could meet these wonderful people. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, uh, I thank uh, all the participants for their hooked in interest uh, for these one and a half hours. And now the session is open for uh, discussion. Anybody would like to uh, question on any of these things, uh, you're welcome to post your questions either in the question answer box or in the chat box. Uh, we'll Tila, can, I, can I interrupt you for a minute? I want to yes, thank Shruti who was actually uh, moderating my uh, uh, slides. I told you I'm technically challenged. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you, you did so a wonderful much. job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Akila. Yeah. So I, I can see that uh, the appreciations are flooded uh, for today's uh, talk of both the speakers, uh, even Lina Ma'am and uh, uh, so Sheila ma'am, uh, it was actually a good thing to have additional English on the FDP because all these FDPs I would have attended before would have had only the mainstreams and uh, I'm happy that through our college, you know, colleges FDP I can, uh, or rather we all could, you know, know more about a little more about uh, the other streams in which, uh, you know, we don't teach. Okay, uh, because it was communicative English, it was BA, uh, BSc. Uh, and uh, additional English. I, I really appreciate the participants who have the patience to attend uh, to all those uh, you know sessions that we have arranged, irrespective of whether they teach or not. Uh, it's really good to know. Uh, we are uh, still waiting for the questions. If any questions, please raise the questions. Yeah, Shruti ma'am, uh, you can post the feedback form now. Yeah, uh, so to all the participants, please note the feedback form for today has been posted uh, in the chat box. Anyway, it will be uh, repeated after, you know, five or 10 minutes where the chats occupy the place, the later other chats, uh, if there are any. Can I expect some questions from the participants? Uh, perhaps not many of them would have gone through the text. I suppose uh, there are no questions, so. Uh. Was there any audio problem? I think there was a comment saying that uh, uh -huh. uh, because uh, your uh, mouthpiece moved. Oh, okay. I'm very uh, for sorry. For the YouTube listeners, uh. actually, 
uh, it would make a, a uh, heavy uh, uh, as i told you know there is a poor uh, network connectivity in this area um, very sorry for it uh, but uh, i'm very sorry for that that's okay ma'am you were audible enough uh, it's okay we could gather whatever you meant to say um i assume that there are no questions uh, for both the speakers uh, yeah and yeah, yeah, uh, right towards the last component of the session that yeah uh, sorry about it uh, uh, actually there was a power uh, cut in my area because of the rain uh, sorry i had to get disconnected uh, so continuing from wherever i was uh, whatever i was talking uh, you know ma'am any of your uh, closing remarks uh, well uh, i don't know why there are no questions uh, i was expecting quite a few Uh, because uh, the novella has uh, you know i have I, because i did not deal with it in great detail so anyway good but at the same time feel sorry that i did not have any questions so that uh, ends uh, with my observation and i take this opportunity to thank every one of you there uh, from the principal to the organizers and those student fraternity who happen to be technically helping you know all of us to make this a successful one thank you akila for giving me this opportunity to share my views and also the efforts that we put in in bringing out this uh, textbook thank you thank you everyone and organizing uh, a platform for additional english text which is something which is rare so I, my yeah. heartfelt thanks to uh, akila at the principal and of course akila a wonderful job done and all the uh, members of your team akila for organizing such yeah, a akila program. and her team good and, yeah. well, and her team yeah. yes yeah and um, thank you everyone the audience yeah i was also looking forward for uh, some questions to be very helpful there was some comment saying that they wanted to share the ppt and all that i think akila you can do that many comments are there please share the ppt please uh, 
please do that yes ma'am that will be shared and also uh, let me remind you participants there was a youtube i mean now even now we are streaming live on youtube and the recorded sessions of all these five days would be available on youtube so any any time that you uh, log in uh, log into youtube and check with jain college fdp all the five days sessions will be there available on the youtube Uh, in which you can also find the PPTs and uh, the PPTs uh, of the both these you know resource persons will be shared once they finalize and send it to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Lina Ma'am and Sushila Ma'am, for your uh, time. Uh, in this pandemic, it was really you know difficult for us to you know uh, gather all the resource persons and uh, you know. Uh, and you know uh, unforeseen you know network problems as such uh, but anyway uh, it is turning out to be a very good uh, faculty development session uh, where uh, we are gathering uh, more and more knowledge as to how to go about the new textbooks and tomorrow will be the last day of the faculty development program uh, where uh, the resource person is dr yoganand rao uh, who will be uh, focusing on the uh, other poems of insights four that is bcom textbook uh, kindly join the session tomorrow at 4 o'clock the same time thank you all for your presence and your interest on behalf of jain college uh, management uh, the department of english and the other staff i'd like to thank everybody um, including the resource persons the volunteers and the technical in charge uh, the uh, the professors that is saravanan sir and shruti ma'am uh, for your extended support Thank you, everybody, and have a nice day, nice evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. All the best for tomorrow. Okay, now. Uh, you can uh, disconnect. Shruti, really, really, ma'am. Ha, five fifty ke disconnect, na?